there we go. And I really appreciate that. I, I uh, if, if the door opens, I want to go through it. And uh, you know, some of the guys, whoops, sorry. Some of the guys, uh, they lose sight of that. But uh, if I got what I deserve to be in hell, and, uh, I didn't mean to say it like that, brother. <laughs> I'll be there with you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to be saved. And uh, it's good to be here. And I don't know what uh, what God has for you to do, but I know He's got something for each one of us to do. And um, this song's about that little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus. I was sitting there praying, like, Lord, what do you want to sing? And I'm going to give this a try. I hadn't sang it for a while, but. The multitudes had gathered on a hill near Galilee. Hear the words of Jesus and his miracles to see. But as the day wore on, <clears throat> excuse me, his disciples came and said, There's not enough to feed them, Lord, should we send them away from a little boy's basket of five barley loaves of bread? And with two fish, five thousand hungry people would be fed. Lord, here's my basket. It's not much, I know. But take it and use it. Please don't refuse it. Maybe. Although I can keep it, I'll give it to you. So Lord, here's my basket. You'll have to ask. It's the least I can do. In each and every life, there's a basket filled with goods, although it may not be used exactly as it should. So many throw it all away, or they keep it for themselves. But others never use it, they just place it on a shelf. The Lord, to know that what you've done for me, my basket can be. But maybe with it, you can feed some hungry soul along the way. Lord, here's my basket. It's not much I know. But take it and use it. Please don't refuse it. Maybe it Although I could keep it, I'll give it to you. So Lord, here's my basket. You don't have to ask. It's the least I can. Amen. Well, I'll butcher that, but. Uh, Whatever you've got, if you give it to the Lord, you use it. And uh, that's a great privilege. Um, let me uh, do one more try anyway and give it a whirl. My soul in sad exile is out on life's sea. Burdened sin and distress Till I heard a sweet voice Say make me your choice Then I entered the haven of rest Though I've anchored my soul 
in the haven of rest, I sail the wild seas no more. But tempest may sweep for the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul. The haven of rest is my Lord. Well, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I sail the wild seas no more. The tempest may sweep for the wild stormy day. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. The song of my soul since the Lord made me whole is in the old story so blessed. Of Jesus who saved, whosoever will have a home in the haven of rest. Oh, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wild seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild in Jesus I'm safe evermore. It's good to be safe in the Lord. Amen. In Jesus you are safe evermore. Amen. Uh, you don't have to worry about going to hell. And the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. All right. I will <clears throat> uh, take your Bible and go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. This is a uh, a new sermon for me, and I always try not to repeat. I was looking over my sermon log, and I see that. Uh, I preached on the blood more than once here, and uh, but the blood, yeah. If you repeat that one, that's not bad, you know. But uh, this, I want to preach a sermon. I uh, I like this thought, and uh, I want to preach a sermon that I call God does not always get what he wants. And let's start in Isaiah 40, and we'll start in verse 12. We're going to read quite a bit, but this here, this is some great, great scripture. It really is. And it's all great, don't get me wrong, but this is real good. In Isaiah 40 and verse 12, who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Now, God does this. And the waters. Now, there's the oceans, but then there's a bunch of water over your head. And God measures it, the hollow of his hand, right there in the palm of his hand. God measured it like that. Um, and made it out heaven with the span. That's the span of his hand. I mean, we look at the stars, and NASA's got telescopes. You no, know, they're they're looking way, way out there. They can't find the edge. They can't count all the stars. I mean, outer space. And the Bible says God's vision stands him like that. That's a great God. Uh, meted out heaven with a span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales 
and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? Who has taught God? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody teaches Jesus Christ in anything. Nobody has. Uh, he is great. He is our God. With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment? And taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. Nobody's done that. God knows those things already. He knows it all. Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. America is less than the drop of a bucket. To God. I mean, a drop in a bucket, but that's the nations. America is just one of them. It's less than the drop of a bucket. Here we are concerned, and I am concerned about America. Don't get me wrong. And I pray for America. And yet, when I read the Bible, what's America? It is less than vanity. It's less than nothing. That's America, is what it is. It, compared to God, no. Uh, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Small dust doesn't even measure. You get a balance, and a little bit of dust. No, they're real accurate. I mean, they said the, the scales in the gold rush could measure the mark of a pencil on a piece of paper. They were so accurate. But a little piece of dust? No. No. That's, that's where we're at. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing. And they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Man, as I read that, I mean, I get all worked up over America. And I read that and it's like, mm, you know what? I'd better be worked up over doing God's will. I'd better be worked up over pleasing my Savior. I'd better be worked up over getting the gospel out. That's what I need to be concerned about. Because when I read that and read God's estimation of America, it's not much. It's not much. And they said there, verse 18, To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare to him, unto him? The workman make melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation Choose the tree that will not rot. Well, there's your, what is that? That's a redwood. A cedar, yeah, a little bit. Um, there's, what is that? The uh, cypress. I don't think that rots. That rot? I don't think cypress does. There's a number of trees that will not rot. And it's all, oh, that's what I want for my God. And not me, not me. Um, he seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a drape, grave an image that should not be moved. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Have they not been told you from the beginning? 
Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. You are at like a grasshopper. <laughs> uh, that stretched out the heavens as a curtain, and spread them out as a tent to dwell in. Uh, that thing there, God. Uh, the universe is like a tent. And it's like a poncho that covers our God. The Lord filleth heaven and earth. And the head, the top of that, is the Lord Jesus Christ. His head is on top there. He's clothed with the universe, according to Hebrews. And one of these days, the Lord is going to change His clothes. He's going to put them off, and there's going to be new heavens and a new earth. That's our God. Our God is great. There's no doubt about it. Verse 23, that bring the princes to nothing. He make the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root, root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them. <clears throat> and they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will you like to be, or shall I be equal, saith the whole Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. Man cannot number the stars. There's too many. God has named them all. That's amazing. Um, call them all by their names, by the greatness of his might. For he that is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. You ever feel like that? God, where are you? Have you lost sight of me? God, do you know where I am? Yes, he does. He knows exactly where you are. As a matter of fact, God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows how many hairs are on your head. Does anybody here this morning know that? We don't know how many, we don't know the number of our hairs. God knows everything about you. Your times and your breath are in His hand. He knows all about you. He has not lost sight of you. He knows exactly where you are. Um, verse uh, 20. Eight, hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's bow our heads for our prayer, Father. Lord God, I pray that you would bless this message. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, these people, 
They don't need to hear from me. God, I am nothing. God, we need to hear from you this morning. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, the God that's never weary, oh God, would you grace us with your presence. Lord, would you minister and work and move in our midst this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Our God is omnipotent. That means he has all power. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. The Lord has all power. Any power that Lucifer has, he got it from my Savior, from your Savior, Jesus Christ has all power. Whatever power America has, they got it from the Lord. Whatever power Russia, China, whoever has, they got it from Jesus Christ. The Lord allowed them to have that. Our God is all power. He's never weak. He is all power. Not only that, our God is omniscient. He knows everything. There is nothing that our God does not know. Think about that. I mean, the Lord knows everything about you and I, but He knows, I mean, He knows everything. He knows tomorrow. He knows a year from now. He knows thousand years ago, two thousand years. Our God is omniscient. He knows everything. There's nothing you're going to teach Him. Did it ever occur to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? I mean, our God is great. There's no doubt about that. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Where can you go to get away from the presence of God? And there's nowhere. The psalmist says, If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I mean, people that they say, Well, I'm going to run from God. I'm going to get away from God. There's nowhere you can go. Our God is omniscient. He's everywhere. He's in and through and beyond. He's everywhere in heaven, in hell. Our God is great. Our God is eternal. He never grows old. He never grows. I mean, He is great. He spoke creation into existence. The Bible says by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth by speaking a uni verse, one verse and there they are absolutely magnificent and the universe that we see has fallen and it's magnificent. 
It's great. And that is the universe where the Bible says uh, the heavens, the stars are not clean in His sight. What, what it must have been before the fall. Oh, how great. How marvelous. How wonderful. I mean, creation. He spoke. There it is. It appears random. And it's not random. The stars have courses. The sun has its course. The earth has its. If we were closer to the sun by a little bit, we would burn up. If we were a little farther away, we would freeze to death. It's all going mathematically precise. And it's all run by our Savior. Absolutely marvelous. On the macro scale, it appears random, and yet it is not. And when you go down to the minute, to the nano, to the molecular, it's so precise. The DNA is a, is a virtual library. A little tiny cell, a molecule with a helix and all that, and it's the manual, and the RNA goes to the DNA and says, I need to build and replicate a part of a liver, or part of your heart, or your eye, or whatever, and he pulls out the manual, and then the RNA goes, all right, that's how it's done, and rebuilds your body and works and, I mean absolutely marvelous and our God uh, in the in the tiny in the in immense everything it shows that there was a designer an infinitely wise designer absolutely marvelous one of these days uh, you are going to see that designer that God is absolutely Absolutely marvelous. Created Lucifer, his zenith of creation. And Lucifer says, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I will exalt my throne. <coughs> and Lucifer, he said, I want to go up there. I want to be God. And the Lord said, Yet thou shalt be brought down to the sides of the pit. You know, God lives within the realm of his word. He lives within the realm of that. So what do you mean? He is, God has no boundaries, and yet God does the boundaries. And yet the word is infinite. And God left heaven, came down, humbled himself became obedient unto death and he descended into hell and then he arose and went back to heaven God humbled himself and wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father Luke's first head I will exalt and he ends up on the bottom. Jesus Christ said, I will humble myself and go down. And now he's exalted above all principality and power. Our God is absolutely amazing, wonderful, grand. These lips of clay cannot justly magnify our God. And yet having said and tried and miserably failing to describe the magnificence of our God. His whole power. And yet to think that God does not always get what he wants. That's, that's astounding. That's absolutely amazing. Let me show you just some instances of that going on in Genesis 1. Look at Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Did God want his creation to fall? No. Did God want Lucifer to rebel? No. Did God get what he wanted? No. Lucifer rebels, goes against God. That wasn't what he wanted. And yet, I don't, I'm trying to preach the unpreachable when I say this. And yet, the wisdom of God is so amazing. That when Lucifer fell, God knowing that he would, he's not this. I look at it and it says, in the beginning, God created. I thought, in the beginning, there begins the wisdom of God. Now, God's wise has always been wise. And yet, when creation fell, God an opportunity to demonstrate love. Love for those that hate him. It's amazing. But it wasn't his will. He didn't want it to fall. He had created it perfect and, and it would have gone on out and everybody would have freely chose to love God because he did give him a free will. And it could have gone on and on but it didn't. God didn't get what he wanted. Wow. That's amazing. So then God recreates. And there's the days of creation. And he creates man and Adam and Eve. And they're in the garden. And he says, now you see that tree right there? Not a good evil? No. Do not partake of that tree. Was that God's will? Yep. And here comes Lucifer. Did God know? Yeah, God knew. But it wasn't his will. He didn't want them to fall, right? He said, don't, don't, don't do that. I don't want you to partake of that. And Lucifer goes to Eve, and she sees it, and you know the story. She goes over, partakes of that tree, gets to Adam, they fall, and God didn't give what he wanted. He didn't give what he wanted. Isn't that amazing? God's like, I didn't want you to do that. And now I've got to kill a lamb. And I, I'm going to clothe you. And, and yet, in the wisdom of God, he's working it all out. And he's above it all, and he's beyond it all. But it's really strange to think that our God, that's the most high God, He doesn't always get what He wants. We're in an age where we got a, we're, we've got a nation of spoiled brats. I want it. I want it. Oh, I want one. I want it. You know, on and on and on. But you know, well, we don't have the money. I don't care. I want it anyway. You know. And with this sensual, selfish self-centered age in which we live and we're very aware of and at times I've been that way it's strange to think of a God that doesn't always get what he wants that is marvelous strange very strange uh, the Lord created it all and he gives an illustration over there in Jeremiah there was the potter. And the potter wrought a vessel on the wheel. You know the story. And he, he spinned it and spinned it. And it says it was marred in the hand of the potter. <laughs> ah, marred. Did the potter want it marred? No. I didn't. But he said, I know what I'll do. I'll beat it down. I'll make another vessel. Seems good to me. And that's an illustration of it all. Did the Lord want him to fall? No. no. 
But he's going to make it again. He's going to do it again. And God does not always get what he wants. That is the amazing thing. Go to Ezekiel 6. To me, what I'm about to show you, I, I don't even know what to say. To me, it's one of the most astonishing verses in the Bible. I was going to say profound, but that's not the right word. This verse to me is absolutely astonishing. I, I am astonished, as the Bible says. And I want you to notice verse 7, that's not the verse. And the slain shall fall in the midst of you, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. God is upset. He loves Israel. He's forgiven them over and over, and He's demonstrated His love and His longing for them to love Him back. Have you ever been rejected? Have you ever had your heart broken? Somebody you love them and you've given, you've done all that you know to do and you're just longing for them to love you back and, and over and over they reject you and reject you and on and they break your heart. Notice. Verse 8. Yet will I leave a remnant that ye may have some that shall escape the sword among the nations when ye should be scattered through the countries that I'm going to judgment's coming I'm going to, I'm going to disperse you you're going to be chased verse 9 and they that escape of you shall remember me among the nations whether they shall be carried captive because I am broken with their whorish heart which hath departed from me. You see that thing? I am broken. Who is that? That's God. That's the one that's so magnificent that spoke it all in the creation. The one that knows all. He's got all power. He's omniscient. And that God was broken. Broken. Weep. Broken. He's given and given and given. And now he's broken. That, to me, is one of the most profound places in the Word of God. He's not getting what he wants. Oh, he could just wipe it all out. He could just go, you're done, gone. Just, we'll do a new universe. But God didn't get what he wanted. Israel's rebelling and rebelling and rebelling. God's weak. If you've gone through that or going through that, your God understands what it's like to be rejected. Not only here, but on the cross. We don't want Him. We don't want Him. That is to me absolutely amazing scripture. Go to Matthew 26. God does not always get what He wants. Look at Matthew 26, verse 36. Oh, that's for the second time. Look at verse 39. Now, this is Gethsemane. This is Jesus praying. 
And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible. Well, with God, all things are possible, right? If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Praise that three times. Now, there's an amazing thing here. Jesus has his own will. And the Father has his will. And he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Was Jesus fully God? Yes. Was he fully man? Yes. Is that the human will? Yes. Or is it? I believe it is. I don't understand. Did he want to get out? Was he God? Yes. Did he get what he wanted? No. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. He went to the cross. He obeyed the Father's will. And he went to the cross. And he died. I was thinking about that. You know, Lord was in a war. He's fighting a fight, fighting a battle for you and I. A battle that we could never win. A battle we could never fight. And I thought about the number of soldiers that were drafted. We don't have the draft anymore. They were drafted in the wars. They didn't want to go. Many of them. And then some of them I'm willing to go. I mean, the cause was right and just. But in Vietnam, they didn't want to go. A lot of them. And there was others. And they went, and they died. They gave their lives. They didn't get their will, and they died. And they died. Not only that, look at Second Peter. Look at Second Peter three. God does not always get what He wants. Second Peter three. And verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us who are not willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Boy, when you think about that, I mean, how many billion are we at? Almost 8 billion people now. I don't know where we're at. 7 or 8 billion. And God wants every one of them to get saved. And out of those 8 billion, what percentage actually gets saved? Not much. Not much. God's not willing that any should perish. And right now, I don't know what the statistic is, Pastor Mike. Every second, people are dying and going to hell. And God's, I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I didn't want that. I didn't want that. God doesn't always give me want. You go out, you tell people about the Lord. You give them a track, you preach on the street, you knock on doors, you tell them, you tell them about Jesus, they're like, no. And the Bible says it's as though God did beseech you by us. When you talk to somebody about the Lord, the Bible says it's as if God is directly talking to them. He said, would you please get saved? And over and over and over, they said, no. No. And God doesn't get what he wants. Who's that? The king of the universe. He doesn't always get what he wants. But there was a day when God got what he wanted. Say, when was that? The day you were born again. You got saved. He 
he smiled, he rejoiced. The day I got saved, he got what he wanted. Because he wanted me, and he wanted you, and he told me. And we prayed, and we accepted the Lord as our Savior. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven. And that day, God got what he wanted. Hallelujah. Thank God that day I did something right. And I made him happy. And he got what he wanted. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord, I pray God that you bless the message. Thank you, Lord God, for being patient and loving and caring. Thank you, Lord God, for being good. You are the only good God. And Lord, thank you for wanting me and each one of us here this morning. God, thank you. Remind us of this, I pray in Jesus' name. how he did that it's already up there <laughs> i saw i was looking around seeing people's faces going yeah hey, we learned that like last week or so <laughs> i did the uh, skirt <laughs> oh, that's good stuff <laughs> and i left it up there and i was like wow and it's funny because i took it down i was going to flip another picture and i forgot and there it was i thought that was pretty amazing rob um, good day. Making it the whole God of the universe and he brings it down to care about just you yeah. for just a second, for just a moment in time. Your life mattered. Your life mattered to him. You know, I mean, with all those people out there and this guy doesn't matter to me and I don't know anything about this guy. I really don't know who's this guy and who's that guy. And, and but God knows. Yeah, he knows. All right, let's pray. Okay. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for our day. We thank you, Lord, for being here for us. We thank you, Lord, for uh, talking us to it today, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, that you use preachers. And, Lord, you get a hold of our hearts. And, Lord, and, uh, I thank you, Lord God, that uh, you work everything out and just mesh everything together, Lord Father. But, uh, Lord Father, thank you for breaking our hearts today. Give us right spirits, Lord. It was a very solemn assembly. Thank you for that, Lord. We love you. Let us be dismissed. Come back tonight in Jesus' name.